Welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Eggs and Issues is supported by presenting sponsors, Bank of America and Martins Point Healthcare, in cooperation with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, First Light Fiber, and WEX. Reception sponsors, Key Bank, Clark Insurance, and Veral Dana. Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs sponsors, AAA Northern New England and Springborn Staffing Center. Community Corner sponsor, Baker Newman Noise. Parking is provided by CV and Mahar Engineers. Our exclusive radio sponsor, WGAN. Listen weekday mornings to Ken and Matt on the WGAN Morning News. Print sponsor, The Forecaster. TV sponsor, WMTW. And e-media sponsor, Main Biz. Special community partners, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, Spectrum Healthcare Partners, the University of Southern Maine, and Southern Maine Community College. And now, please welcome Portland Community Chamber of Commerce President, Jack Lufkin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for coming today for what promises to be a very enlightening discussion with uh, John Jennings. I'll have him join me uh, pretty soon up on the stage. Uh, my name is Jack Lufkin with NBT Bank, and I'm the volunteer president of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Um, in a few minutes, I, I'll have John up here, uh, but before we do, I have a couple of announcements. And I'd also like to welcome some members of the Portland City Council who are with us today. Uh, here today are Councilors Jill Dusan, Justin Costa, Nick Mavadonis, Pius Ali, Belinda Ray, and Spencer Thibodeau. And so welcome all of you to our <laughs> presentation. As is our custom now, we have uh, information on upcoming chamber events listed at all of your tables, and you can also find out what's happening uh, at our newly redesigned, if you haven't checked it out, it's an excellent design, uh, newly redesigned website at portlandregion.com. I do want to start today uh, on a topic that's been uh, familiar. You've heard me talk uh, numerous times uh, about this, and, and this is the, the, um, the, the vote on the, uh, the paid sick leave. If you haven't uh, been, been up to date on the news, uh, there was a critical vote taken at the City Council on this issue. Uh, the Chamber's been involved in this over the past 18 months that the uh, City has been um, studying it. On Monday evening, after a very robust and discussion around the merits of this ordinance, the Portland City Council voted against the ordinance five to four. This topic was a very passionate issue for many. We agreed that people should be able to stay home when sick or to care for a loved one who was sick. We had strong concerns about a Portland-specific ordinance that impacted only Portland businesses. We maintained our position that should anything pass regarding a paid sick leave mandate, it should be on a statewide level. That's why when the state legislature brought forward a proposal requiring employers to provide employees with paid time off, we urged the city council to allow the state to occupy this space thereby alleviating, alleviating concerns around a Portland-specific mandate. I would like to thank all of the members of the Portland City Council for the time and effort that they spent on this issue as well, as well as the thoughtful deliberation that they put into the crafting of the ordinance uh, all the way to the final vote. I would also like to thank all of the businesses and employers and employees who stepped up on this issue and shared their concerns with us at the Chamber and with the Council. Your voices matter, in this, uh, and it definitely made a difference. I'd also like to um, recognize Quincy Hensel and the leadership that she, Britt Vitalius, and others on the Portland uh, board uh, uh, had on this issue. We engaged on this issue in a very meaningful way from the very beginning, and uh, we're very pleased with the end result and believe the state law will provide a reasonable and balanced approach requiring a majority of employers to provide most of their employees with PTO while also providing an exemption to any employers who already provide PTO plans. The state bill is making its way through the process in Augusta and we'll keep you up to date on the final outcome of that. Uh, if you hadn't seen uh, yesterday, the Senate, the main Senate voted unanimously in support of the bill. So that is now making its way through to the House. So again, thank you to the Portland City Councilors, particularly those who agreed with our approach that the state is the, the proper uh, forum for this kind of a mandate. So thank you all for that, and we appreciate your, uh, again, your help. So. <laughs> you. 
And you can always stay up to date on all of the advocacy efforts that the Chamber is undertaking. You can subscribe to the Chamber's advocacy newsletter, uh, and you can do that also at portlandregion.com. We are once again par partnering with Maine Green Power. This program has provided enough renewable energy to power all of the eggs and issues events from now through the rest of 2019. Maine Green Power is the voluntary green power option for electricity that is available to Maine homes and businesses. It is sponsored by the Maine Public Utilities Commission. And now a, uh, a favorite uh, topic of mine, I'd like to welcome the newest members of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce, Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. This past month, they include Birchwoods at Canco, The Telling Room, Allure Nails and Spa, Cycle Bar Portland, Emory Leadership Group, Independent Ice Company, Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, Maine Language Connect, Maine Works, Snow Lion Repertory, First Vehicle Services, American Family Care AFC Urgent Care, Christy Wagner Voiceover, Mathinism, math, uh, somebody help, Mathinism of Portland. I hope I didn't butcher that. Mathnasium, thank you. Ah, math. <laughs> Picked the wrong week to drop off coffee. That's a, oh well. And, and last but not least, uh, Bethel Kids Care. So let's give a warm welcome to these new members. <laughs> Fragile. So, yeah. uh, AAA Northern New England and Springborn staffing provide support for our Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs program. This allows area high school and college students to attend eggs and issues. With us today, we have students from the University of Southern Maine and the Southern Maine Community College. If you are here representing those, would you please stand and let us welcome you. <laughs> Headlight Audio Visual does a fantastic job providing us with all of our technical support, and the video from today's Eggs and Issues will be available later this week on the Chamber's YouTube channel and on the Chamber's website. The Portland Public Library is our FMI sponsor, who will provide additional information regarding today's topic after this event. You'll receive an email about that later this week. Baker Newman & Noyes sponsors our Community Corners program. Today's featured organization is the Portland Recovery Community Center. The Portland Recover Recovery Community Center's mission is to provide support, education, and resources for people recovering from and affected by addiction, and to spread the message of hope throughout the state of Maine. PRCC's vision is that every person affected by addiction in Maine will have direct access to a local recovery community center that provides support groups, education, individual resources that enhance their ability to heal, strengthen, and grow in their recovery pathway throughout all stages of their journey. At the heart of what the Portland Recovery Community Center does is love creating an environment that is safe, welcoming, and conducive to doing the hard work of recovery is fundamental for all their work with peers, family members, and our efforts within the community. PRCC is an open place where people can come in any time to participate in recovery activities and offerings. They strive for an atmosphere of hope, wellness, and care for one another. They honor each person's right to self-determination and discovery of their own recovery pathway and journey. PRCC has over 6,000 individuals per year who participate in meetings and activities. In 2018 alone, there were over 42,000 visits to PRCC and 7,500 hours of volunteer work. With us today from Portland Recovery, Community, Portland Recovery Community Center are Executive Director Leslie Clark, Recovery Coach Aaron McKinney, Project Manager Nicole Proctor, and board members Justin Fenty, John Burrow, and Carolyn Delaney. Please let us welcome you. Thanks. And I'm sure that will come up as a topic as we, uh, as, we, as we move forward here. So on to today's presentation. Now, let me give you a little bit about the format. I'm going to have a couple of uh, questions that I'm going to ask the city manager. But you'll notice that we have microphones spread around the room. Uh, we will 
uh, absolutely maintain some time at the end for your questions and answers. Uh, hopefully, some of the topics that we're going to talk about today are, are topics that are on your mind as well. John Jennings has been Portland City Manager since the summer of 2015. As Portland's manager, he has overseen the city on the rise. Simplified permitting has allowed net growth to sprout through the peninsula, and new initiatives placed an emphasis on innovation and embracing Maine's startup culture. But that is not to say that Portland is without its issues. We all know the impact of homelessness and the opioid epidemic have, on, have had on our community. And while new development has been a boon for Portland, it has also placed added stress on the city's transportation infrastructure and on the working waterfront. We'll be discussing these topics and more. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Portland City Manager John Jennings to the stage. No standing ovation? Well, that was, <laughs> as my understanding is, I'm in your pocket all the time, so. <laughs> Some of the silly things that are said. <laughs> so. we, we don't do silliness here at the Chamber. Oh, perfect. We're a very serious, okay. mathnasian focused group we are. Right? <laughs> Great job on the introductions, by the way, Jack. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, John, um, thank you for being here, first of all. And thank you for your uh, three and a half plus years of, of leadership uh, with the city. Um, you have uh, in, uh, your, your past uh, it includes both public and private sector. And one of the things that I know you're very passionate about is taking some of the lessons that you've learned uh, regarding changing things up, doing things more efficiently. And with that, we know that you've recently created an Office of Innovation and um, so I'd like you to, to give us an, an understanding of that because it, it's, that word can sometimes get lost in the translation, but as you and I have discussed, this is really permeating the culture in City Hall. Uh, Jack, thank you for, the, uh, for that question. I, I'd like to just go back a bit, if I could, before I address that. I, in 1981, I was a high school senior, um, and I was a you know, president of the student body, a total geek and um, had organized a trip uh, with um, my classmates to go to the inauguration of the president, which happened to be President Reagan. And so I was actually standing on the, the grass of the Capitol uh, listening to the president's inaugural address. And he came to that um, passage when he said that government is the problem. And I have fundamentally disagreed with that statement my entire adult life. And so my mission every time I've been in government has been to try to demonstrate to people that government can be effective. Government can be efficient in all the things that we do. So when I had this unbelievable opportunity to uh, assume this position in Portland, I made it my mission to try to create the most efficient government uh, that we could uh, have in Portland. And so for me, um, establishing an office of innovation is the kind of the natural next step of all the things that we've been trying to do. Uh, I'm very blessed that, and the city is very blessed, uh, to have Lena Garrity, who is actually sitting. Lena, do you mind just standing up? Yeah. Lena is our new innovation director. I'm also uh, thrilled that we have um, uh, Jessica Grandin, who is also our communications director, but also is going to help lead the effort on, on the innovation side, as well as Hannah Pickering, who uh, is our new IT director. The three uh, individuals will really lead this innovation effort. Um, and there's so many things that we want to do. We've already made a lot of progress, whether it be transportation, um, uh, internal uh, efficiencies around inspections and permitting. We still have a ways to go there. I mean, we're not, we're not perfect yet. Um, certainly, it's always the goal. But, um, and then, of course, customer service. Uh, customer service is a key component of anything, um, whether it be public or private entities, to treat uh, the folks that we interact with as a customer. And so that has been a very different mindset that we've also tried to bring in. So it's not just about the shiny new uh, technology. It is a fundamentally different way of approaching government. It's looking at ways in which we can take the best practices from the private sector, but also recognizing that we're a government entity accountable to the people. And so that is uh, certainly the mission. 
Uh, I think we've had uh, a lot of success to date, but there's a lot more still to do. How would, uh, I'm thinking of, of our audience, uh, the, these, are, these are business leaders um, who have to deal with providing services in, in the best, most efficient manner on a day-to-day -day basis. If, if folks in the audience had um, an interest in trying to be a participant in the, the thinking relative to this, is there a way in which they can engage with your office? Oh, absolutely. In fact, yeah. um, uh, Lena and I just met last week about the need to engage with the private sector here in Portland, and not just the city of Portland, but the greater Portland region, because we do see this as a, a regional approach. While um, we're uniquely responsible for the city of Portland, we also believe that we have a re regional responsibility as well. So um, I would invite anyone and everyone to contact me directly so we can begin a collaboration um, with the private sector to be able to create not only an efficient government, but a, a better way of addressing a lot of the critical issues that face the city. Unfortunately, with growth comes anxiety and fear. And we've had a tremendous period of growth here in the city of Portland. We have to grow. I mean, it's not, we can't just put a cap on the city and say we, that's the way it always was and, and that was the best way. We have to grow, but we have to do it in a responsible way. And so having a partnership and an engagement with all of you and others, um, I think that that is the best way we can go about growing the city, growing the city in a responsible way, but also making sure that we're listening in city government. Thank you. That reminds me, uh, Dick Berenger is in the audience. I, I saw him earlier. A couple of years ago, we hosted a forum on, on, on growth, and, and I think I just steal his quote or, or to butcher it. Um, you know, change is happening. It's whether or not we, we get in front of that. So we applaud you for your efforts there. Let's, let's stick with the development that is happening in Portland, and this may tie back around to some of the innovation challenges, but there is an awful lot of economic development activity happening, particularly in the eastern end of, of the Portland waterfront, but really it's happening in, in virtually every, every pocket of Portland. But let's, let's stay on the peninsula for, for a moment. Uh, we have WEX, we have Covetris, we have a lot of square footage coming on, online. Um, can you help us understand what, what's happening relative to, the, to the, the infrastructure development there, the, the transportation, the traffic movement and such? Well, this was, um, this was a design of the city back in the early 2000s. Um, the, the city strategically put together a master uh, plan for the eastern waterfront. And part of that strategic plan was the development of the Ocean Gateway parking garage. That was the catalyst that would enable a lot of the growth that was anticipated. And then, of course, we had the Great Recession, and which essentially stopped any type of development in that area. So now we're seeing the fruits of that vision that others, way before me, um, had put in place. Um, and so now we're, we are seeing Wax, Covetris, and others. Uh, there are other um, companies that are interested in relocating there, uh, as well as other parts of the city of Portland. So I think that is a very, very good thing. I know a lot of people want to, um, describe that type of growth as a bad thing. I fundamentally disagree with that notion. It's the way in which we grow, though, is um, I think the most important. So one of the, going back to the innovation discussion, one of the things that um, we have taken on as a city is how do we grow responsibly, particularly in the transportation sector? I know a lot of people are worried about parking, because it's in my email every single day. Um, <laughs> I, I know a lot of people are worried about congestion and, and a lot of other issues that relate to growth. Um, and please know that we do not have our heads in the sand as it relates to those type of issues. We are fundamentally looking at all of that. Um, to the point where a year plus ago we asked, we talked about having a master planning study for Commercial Street. Commercial Street is a wonderful street, but frankly as a transportation hub, it is a disaster. And so what we have, we're doing is we're in the final stages of, of doing this tra a transportation plan on Commercial Street. But I can tell you that whenever you have a central hub and certainly a commercial district like Commercial Street is, and you have no signalization, you have 18 crosswalks, and there's no way to hold up anyone, you are going to have a disaster. 
Um, and so for us, what we're looking at is potentially the reduction of the number of crosswalks um, and then the in installation of, of what, we are, what we call the Hawk system. And that may not be the, the system that we ultimately install, but essentially it's a system that will hold up pedestrians at the crosswalks. And it's all AI, artificial intelligence-based system where they're communicating with one another. So therefore, you have a flow of traffic, but also they turn and allow the pedestrians to safely cross. I actually think Commercial Street's one of the most unsafe streets in the entire city because we have a lot of commercial vehicles in the middle of the street. I know I live on Commercial Street and I drive on Commercial Street and I'm always having to go very slow because I'm concerned about a pedestrian popping out behind one of those uh, trucks that are in the middle of Commercial Street. So I think you'll be hearing a lot more about that, but using um, an artificial intelligence has been critical to the, some of the things that we're trying to do. We recently installed a system called SureTrack in the Morrill's Corner area. And SureTrack is, is essentially a brain that we have put in into Stevens Avenue, into um, Warren Avenue, uh, and Allen Avenue. And those three intersections are now communicating when, what, with one another. And the data has shown us that a 23% reduction in drive time through those three intersections. And that's what technology and innovation and certainly the efficiency that we're all trying to do in the city will lead to. We're going to be doing the exact same thing on Franklin Street. Um, the idea is to install the SureTrack system and then we'll be able to flow traffic in and out of the city on a much more robust and efficient manner. I mean, I do want to recognize the city council, though. If it wasn't for the city council supporting um, our efforts to the tune of an initial $4 million investment in smart city technology and another $4 million investment in smart in the uh, phase two, we would not be doing any of this. And so it really was the support of the city council that we have been able to, uh, I think, make incredible changes that will lead to a, a much better city. Sticking in that, that region, um, there, there's an awful lot of um, um, pressure on the waterfront. And we have uh, a process ongoing right now relative to uh, tweaking the zoning in, in, the, in the central waterfront zone, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, is basically bounded by Ocean Gateway to the east and the International Marine Terminal to the west. Um, can you give us a, a snapshot of where that is in its process? Uh, yes, I, you know, I, I do want to admit, uh, I've been in Portland for over 10 years now. I came to start the Red Claws, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I fundamentally didn't understand the importance of the working waterfront. I came from Boston where we frankly didn't care about the waterfront because you can barely see the waterfront now in, in Boston, unfortunately. And over time, in, in, in meeting with fishermen and lobstermen and others um, who absolutely need this waterfront for their livelihood, I've grown to understand the challenges that they have had uh, with growth. And so when there was a discussion last year about the idea of a referendum that would essentially freeze development in the waterfront central zone, I asked uh, both uh, the working waterfront group as well as peer owners to allow the city to engage with them to see if we could not have a referendum, but also find a fundamental path forward. And they both were willing to do that. And so we avoided a referendum. And during the course of the last several months, we've been meeting cooperatively in uh, City Hall. Uh, members of the, of the, lobster, the uh, lobstermen and the working waterfront, peer owners, and concerned citizens. And so we have had some unbelievably productive conversations over the course of the last several months that has led now to a series of changes in zoning that um, will, I think, ensure the working waterfront remains a vital part of the city of Portland, not just now and not just tomorrow, but for generations to come. Because if you think about the history of Portland, and this is where I needed to educate myself and to be educated by uh, the folks that are working on the water. 
that for decades and centuries, this has been their livelihood. And they want to be able to enable their children and their grandchildren and future generations to be able to have that same opportunity to go out and work on the water. And so for me, there are places to develop in the city of Portland. Um, but we have to be conscious and intentional in making sure the decisions we make do not harm that, type, that industry. And so the, 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 I know that, I was joking recently, that, that uh, if any of us were happy about the changes we're proposing, then we weren't doing our jobs. And so the fishermen and lobstermen, they didn't get everything they want in the zoning changes, and certainly the peer owners feel as though that they're uh, being challenged as, as well. But I do think that we've come to a compromise that will certainly ensure future growth on the water side, but in a responsible way, that will not, will not uh, eliminate their opportunity to do what they need to do um, on, the, um, on the water. So I'm very proud of the work that the, the group has done. It's coming to the planning board um, next week. We have had incredible staff, both our planning staff and Bill Dienemann, who, who does a lot of work on the, on the waterfront. They are really the unsung heroes, if you will, of the work where, uh, not just now, but uh, in 2010 and even before that, um, they were dealing with these challenging issues. So again, it's, it's growing the city in a responsible way and making sure that we do not make decisions that today that have a negative impact for tomorrow and in the future. That is really the, th the fundamental thing that I keep in the back of my mind. We have a secret sauce in Portland which is really the quality of life. And it's our job to not, not to mess that up. And it is a, we take that enormously uh, we, in a responsible way. And so um, I'm very proud of the work we've done on the waterfront. So critical to maintaining that industry is the birthing space. Mm -hmm. And I know the city has been um, undertaking uh, 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 research to take some of the, the soils that are contaminated from hundred plus years of, of runoff from the streets and have deposited at the, at the water's edge. Um, wh where does that, is, uh, the CAD cell as it were, where, right. where, is, where does that stand? Well actually we're making progress on that front. We, um, the Economic Development Committee led by Councillor Costa who was here uh, recently gave us um, the, uh, the authority um, to be able to use TIF money to finish the, the project to get us to the permitting stage. At the same time, I was able to talk with the MDOT commissioner, Bruce Van Note, uh, who is a terrific person and we work incredibly well together, um, to seek the state's support for a what's called a build grant. And it's a, a federal grant that, that essentially takes on these kind of huge infrastructure type of problems. And so the idea is that um, we're going to be able to um, finished the process that was started seven years ago. And when I was in South Portland, actually, I was on the CAD cell committee. So what we're gonna do is build a, or dig a big hole in the, in the water that we can then put these, uh, these the soils that, the, um, that are so damaged because of the runoff of, year, of, of essentially a century um, that we'll be able to dredge the piers on both the Portland side and most of the South Portland side will be able to dump that into the CAD cell and we'll be able to cap it. And so that will ensure the productivity of those piers and wharves um, at least for the next 100 years. So this it's a pretty important thing yeah. to do. And unfortunately, the price tag is not cheap. We estimate it to be around $30 million. And so there will be a match that the city will have to um, put in, but uh, Greg Mitchell is here, who's our economic development director. He's done a masterful job in, in, um, in helping the city uh, realize our uh, area-wide TIF policy. Uh, and so we'll be able to use TIF proceeds to be able to, um, for the city match, so it's not, not a uh, taxpayer-funded type of situation. And then, of course, federal and state support to be able to get us to that, that area in which we can dredge, 
we can ensure the, uh, the future of the, the working waterfront for at least a century. That reminds me of, uh, yes, yeah, so let's clap for that. That's fantastic. <laughs> It reminds me of the, um, the complexity of, of the Portland city budget and um, all of the different factors, the different revenue streams, the different outflows and such. Can you give the There's audience... There's not that many revenue streams, uh, my friend, so... <laughs> Trying to be generous. Um, can, can, you, can you give the, uh, the audience just a little snippet? We, we see all of the development activity. We see all of the, particularly hotels and new housing development. All of those are generating a substantial amount of tax revenue. And yet, you know, uh, taxes continue to, to climb. There, there's a complexity there that can be oftentimes overlooked. Can you, in, in very brief terms, give an overview of that? You know, this is one of the most challenging aspects of our job in municipal government is, is really to communicate things in a way in which people fundamentally understand and they, they get. And so when you, when you hear that the city of Portland grew um, our valuation grew at, eight, uh, at a rate of $85 million, which is what essentially we grew last year. Um, you would think that that's $85 million in new taxation. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. Um, it's 85, not, 85 million in new valuation. And that really translates to about $2 million in new taxes through the formula in which the state and the city goes through. That one million of that goes to the schools and one million of it goes to, uh, in this current fiscal budget, um, one million of it goes to the city. And, and so there are a lot of people will see these big numbers and they think they're, we, we certainly are growing and, and, and that is what is great about dispersing some of the enormous pressure that we have on property, the property tax side to, um, to be able to grow and to hopefully someday begin to reduce the property, property tax burden. But um, when the policies of the last eight years come into play uh, at, at the state level, the enormous uh, issues and funding challenges the city had to take over, uh, it easily erases. And then there are other things like the pension bond a lot, and again, this is arcane things, but for many years, the city decided not to have, to have a 0% tax increase. Well, there are ramifications to that. Uh, if you're not putting money into your, your pension obligation every year, it's going to catch up with you. And so, unfortunately, back in the early 2000s, the city, um, or I'm sorry, the 1990s, I believe it was, had to go out and, and issue a bond to catch up for on the pension obligation. And we're paying the price for that now. That bond doesn't mature until 2026. We're paying, in this current budget, it's $15 million on that pension bond. Um, and it's increasing about a million a year. So when people hear that we're flush, you know, that you have all of this new, uh, new taxes and and everything. It's just there are a lot of burdens on the municipal budget that were decisions that were made long ago. Now, once we get to 2026, 20, I'm sure the people who are around City Hall will have a party, and um, and they'll uh, they'll be able to do a lot of wonderful things. But it's really important, and the councilors that are certainly here uh, today share with me uh, that we have to manage the city in a fiscally responsible way. And so, um, as much as we would love to do a lot of new things, a lot of aspirational things. We simply cannot get there uh, until we, we uh, get to a better place financially. Let's switch gears, if we could, to a little bit more of, of the social service <clears throat> aspect. There's been a lot of uh, uh, coverage about the, uh, the relocating of the Oxford Street Shelter, um, you know, the services that the city will provide, the services that other organizations such as Preble Street uh, provide. Um, can, can you help us understand you know, what the state is of the city relative to its social services? Uh, I think it's one of the most important questions that could be asked today, to be honest with you, because the city is in a, what I would term as a dire situation um, around uh, the shelters, uh, the family shelter as well as the emergency shelter, some of the um, challenges that we're seeing uh, with 
other parts of the country sending um, asylum seekers or others to us, watching police cars from other communities uh, dropping off individuals in front of our emergency shelter when they have a responsibility as much as the city of Portland to be able to address uh, critical issues in their communities. So we have, um, we have a, a very, it's a very challenging time. On the, on the emergency shelter, we're fortunate that we have a, a city councilor in Belinda Ray who has said that the existing situation on Oxford Street is unacceptable. And she has um, led an effort with the Health and Human Services Committee to get us to a place where we can imagine a new facility, a comprehensive facility, a homeless services center that actually provides the services that our homeless individuals, people who are experiencing homelessness, can actually have the type of assistance that they so desperately need. We've also been fortunate, and Portland is, you know, I just love this city because there are a lot of uh, nonprofits uh, here, Bob Fowler from Milestone, I saw him earlier, and others, and they have stepped up and they have said, how can we help the city? And so Avesta has come to us and said, we'd like to build a 55 and older acute care facility because we have people who are being released from hospitals directly to the shelter. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the training, we don't have the facility to be able to handle uh, COPD or any number of other critical uh, issues, uh, health-related issues. And so Avesta steps up and they say, we want to help you. Uh, Opportunity Alliance steps up and says, we want to build a facility for mental health and substance use. Uh, Community Housing of Maine, they've stepped up and said, we want to help you build more affordable housing in the, in the city that will help you with the number of individuals who are at the shelter. Others have stepped up. Kevin Bunker, who is a developer here um, in Amistad, are partnering on a facility on State Street that will enable women to be able to get unique and important care and then transition to micro units in the same, um, in, on the same property. Kevin texted me and said, I want to talk with you. And uh, in the conversation I had with him, he said, you know, I could build 30 luxury condos here, but I feel a sense of responsibility to this community that instead of 30 luxury condos, how can we help? You know, and that's the kind of conversations that you, in my position, get thr are thrilled about. And so, again, I think we're so blessed here that we have so many individuals. Recently, and they asked not to be named, but a group of prominent individuals uh, made a donation of $45,000 to help with um, the Community Support Fund, which uh, was established back in 2015 is a very challenging time, and it is, but there are solutions on the table. I know it has created, a, the, the Homeless Service Center has created a lot of anxiety in various neighborhoods throughout the city. But a lot of times we, we, as staff, and then most importantly, the council, they have to make tough decisions. And on May 20th, uh, as, as the schedule is uh, as of now, the city council will debate and discuss um, the future of uh, future location of the Homeless Service Center. We, um, we've all heard and understand in, in, in our community corner today um, the, the impact of the, of the opioid crisis. And I know this, this parallels what we were just, just talking about, but can, can you give us a, a sense? We, you know, a couple of years ago, we had Chief Soschuk at the time, um, people from the, 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 the providers, a, a, a physician. It, Chief it's who? A, uh, Soschuk? Soschuk. Yeah. I don't know who that guy is. No. <laughs> You know, I hire this guy, right? And you know, he comes and in, comes into City Hall. He's there four months, and then he's off to the state. You know, no, I love the guy. He's, he's like one of my best pals. So, uh, what, what struck everybody in that in that uh, discussion, though, was the complexity of the issue. Yep. And so, can you give us a, a sense of what the City of Portland is doing to try to assist with this scourge? Well, I would say the City of Portland is, uh, in many ways, doing God's work. Um, we have staff people who are on the front lines, whether it's the fire department, whether it's the police department, whether it's the incredibly compassionate individuals who are working at the sh in the shelters. Um, we are really addressing the, the crisis on the front lines head on. But fundamentally, 
it takes a different policy, a set of policies. When you look at the city, and this is, I've had a problem with our country for, for a very long time because I believe we've abdicated our responsibility to the mentally ill for at least the last 50 years. And the individuals that you'll see on the streets of Portland and elsewhere, those individuals should be in a situation where they're receiving care. Um, and unfortunately, we decided, we made a decision that as a country, uh, that um, we were not going to help those individuals or that we were going to put them in a different environment, which of course hasn't worked. And so that to me, those are the larger policy issues that on a state and federal level that we need to address. But here in Portland, we, I think, are doing a very good job of trying to address what um, we deal with in the real world. I will also say, which is what worries me the most about this coming summer, is we're seeing a transition uh, from the use of opiates to meth. Opioids have a sedative impact on many. Meth is a completely different world. And so we're seeing a lot more aggressive behavior and talking with our uh, police chief and others in the community that um, we are, the aggressive behavior uh, is really kind of getting out of control. We've had, to, we've had to institute new policies at the emergency shelter protect, to protect our staff um, because of a lot of the bad behavior that's going on. But the one thing I do want to just mention, though, when we, oftentimes we loop everybody into this term homeless, uh, you know, home, the homeless population, and it's just simply not true. There are a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness that are really good people. They are in a challenging situation. With that said, we have, there are others in our community who are fundamentally bad people. And those are the individuals that are, we're going after and we're going after in a big way. Uh, we've taken the gloves off and um, those individuals who are, frankly, have come to our community, and we know who they are. They come up from the south during the spring and summer and they're here to create havoc and cause chaos. And so just uh, in the last couple of days, we had a horrible situation with a, a property or a, a store owner on Congress Street. Um, that is unacceptable. If you want to come to our city and participate, and certainly we're compassionate and, and, and willing to help anyone, but there are societal norms. And we're going to hold people accountable. We're going after businesses who will sell to visibly intoxicated individuals or other things. We're certainly going after the drug trade. There are a lot of things that we're doing now that are critically important, I think, for the safety and well-being of the people who live here, who work here, and frankly, who play here. And so that is, uh, it's a very aggressive approach, but I think it's long past due that we have to have some set of norms uh, in our community and that certain behavior is just not going to be acceptable. The chamber has been, a, and, our, and our member companies, uh, more specifically, have been a participant in the, um, uh, the um, Opportunity Crew, uh, where we- And thank you for that, by the way, because that's been incredible, and Quincy, thank you for all your support on that. Uh, tremendous support in the business community for, for that. Will we see that again this Absolutely. year? Absolutely. Okay. It's actually one of the things we're, yeah. we're most proud of, the Opportunity Crew. We, and we've had great success from the individuals who participated uh, in the Opportunity Crew. Um, one of uh, the guys who have, has overseen that program recently was at, a, um, at, at, was at the Cross Insurance Arena. And one of the individuals uh, who worked in the op Opportunity Crew was were working at the Cross Insurance Arena um, in concessions. Mm -hmm. And he asked her how she was doing and she, she just was glowing. So I'm doing great, I finally, uh, I've, I have stable housing. And so those are the kind of things that you, we just really love doing and the outcomes are so important. The unemployment rate in the state nationally and particularly in the city of Portland is, is arguably at, at basically zero um, when you factor in just, just natural turnover. Um, there was uh, created a couple of years ago the Office of Economic Opportunity can, can, you, can you talk about sort of what the city is doing to try to foster um, folks who, who, who want to work to come to this community, to find meaningful employment, to reach into sectors of the population that was having a, a more difficult time finding employment? 
can talk about that? Yeah, the Office of Economic Opportunity is uh, it's led by Julia uh, to, uh, Torrijo. She actually worked at the state in at the Department of HHS, and she does a fantastic job. It's a, it's an enormous job, though. As you can imagine, one individual, and fortunately the Economic Development Committee asked me to put money in the budget to hire a second person for this office. Um, a lot of really important work reaching out to the various immigrant communities, uh, business owners, large corporations, companies, to see if we can pair uh, those folks who are in our community um, who do not maybe have access to all of the different things that they need to be able to do to have stable and permanent empl employment. So I think Julia and the entire city is very focused on getting people into a productive situations. We also have another program in the HHS department, which it's called the HIRE program, which we created to really focus getting people into permanent job uh, opportunities as opposed to existing solely on general assistance. So the office, the OEO office, they're doing great work. Um, fortunately, actually, again, the Economic Development Committee, you know, people think that that committee may just be about supporting and, uh, new, new development, but it's an incredible committee uh, that actually does a lot more than just that. In fact, last night, the, the committee, again, Councillor Costa is the chair of that committee, and Councillor Mavadonis, and. Councillor Ali and Councillor um, Thibodeau, who are all here, uh, supported a, um, a workforce training program uh, for Portland Adult Ed and also for the community. And so we'll be rolling that new program out uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, July, that people, that entities, organizations will be able to access, again, TIF money, using money strategically, the TIF funds that we have, strategically to incentivize workforce development within the context of the city of Portland, both from uh, new immigrants, new Mainers, but also for existing uh, opportunities um, that uh, either the business sector or the, the, or the uh, nonprofit sector, they have um, job training programs and we want to we want to uh, participate in the success of those programs. Fantastic. What I'd like to do now is uh, open it up to to questions from the audience, John. That's been very very informative, and I'm sure you're going to get um, a bunch of uh, interesting questions as well. I would encourage even the, particularly the students. Oh they, no, they, I the see. Students ask the tough. There's the first question right there. So, do do we accept questions from old counselors? <laughs> <laughs> old. <laughs> so, former Councillor Sasevic. Thank you briefly, John. Um, first of all, thank you for remaining true to your pledge when we interviewed you. You said, if you don't want a strong city manager, don't hire me. You've been a strong city manager, and I think the city's a lot better off because of your leadership. So thank you. Thank you. Did, you. did you end up voting for me or not? I can't remember. <laughs> I was unsure. <laughs> I, I know it was a close vote, but I voted but for you I... before I voted against you. <laughs> okay, <right>? perfect. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to squeeze in two quick questions. Metro has ridership has gone up from 1.4 million to over 2 million this year in five years. What do you see? Uh, what would you like to see Metro doing more of um, in order to help solve parking congestion issues uh, in Portland? And the second one is: Would you happen to have any thoughts on uh, Portland and the need for a modern, uh, attractive convention and uh, conference center? <laughs> Can we screen these questions before? <laughs> First of all, I think Metro is doing a fantastic job. Uh, Greg Jordan is a terrific leader of Metro. Um, and they're already doing a lot of the things that I think uh, are important uh, specifically for the peninsula. They're looking at the routes um, on peninsula to fundamentally change those routes that make it more effective and more efficient to be able to transit people uh, on the peninsula. So I think Metro is is really doing a terrific job um, already. I think that we'll see a, a lot more growth in Metro going forward. Um, on the convention center, obviously I think we all would love to have a convention center, a modern convention center. The question is how do you pay for it? The city of Portland, we simply don't have the resources. Um, when I was talking about aspirational ideas, that's certainly an aspirational, but that is really, the state has to decide. Uh, Portland is the economic hub of an entire state. 
we are the, the, the place where everybody seems to want to come. So I think the state needs to um, decide whether they're going to embrace Portland as, uh, a, and have the funding uh, mechanisms put in place for a convention center. Other cities of our size have they've done this. And, this is, and so I believe that if we all come together, we can figure out all these problems. I think one of the great frustrations, frustrations I have when we were, we were talking about it at, um, at our table is there are a lot of big problems that we need to solve. And unfortunately, we're, we're messing around on the edges at times. Um, and we're, you know, we're frustrated with one another. And I just think that it's really important, particularly with the dysfunction that we see in the national level. Um, and you know, as a community, we can come together and solve a lot of problems uh, together. And so that's where I, I hope that uh, we can get to with a convention center and many other things um, that, um, that are so important. Hello. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Chelsea Stevens. I'm a USM social work student. Um, I've been working closely with the homeless population over the course of the last year, and my question is in relation to the sh new shelter location, particularly the site proposed at Riverside Industrial Complex. Uh, should the shelter be located so far outside of the peninsula, what is the city's transportation plan for getting people to their peripheral services that are located on the, shelter, on the peninsula, like um, clinic services and housing and, and labor services that they use in the peninsula? Well, Chelsea, thank you not only for the question, but thank you for all that you're doing. I saw you stand up earlier when, uh, when the students were recognized. and. I was thinking to myself, I, I hope that one day you'll consider working in government um, because we need folks like you um, to, uh, to bring your passion and commitment to municipal government. I think that it is a very difficult and challenging set of circumstances with uh, the location of the, um, uh, the, the homeless service center. I do think that if the council, and the council will just ultimately decide where this locate, where, wherever the location be, ends up being, is I do believe and actually know that we will put together a transportation plan associated with the homeless service center that will make sure that individuals who are in the shelter, whether it be Riverside or any, uh, any number of other locations that it could have gone, um, we are not going to strand people. I also would also just challenge the notion that everyone needs to be in the downtown. If you look at shelters uh, across the country, actually, Councillor Suslovic, former Councillor Suslovic, uh, and I and others went down to the Boston area, and we saw uh, a shelter um, actually a, near the police station in Quincy, Mass, and it was in an industrial area. But so, and then in Bangor, I mean, they have a shelter out by the airport. So I don't believe that the locate, it depends on really what the city is committed to doing. And I, I do want to assure you, the city is committed 100% in having a robust transportation plan wherever the shelter ends up. The most important thing is that we get someplace. What's going on in Oxford Street, when you really have a, it's a three family. It's housing 154 individuals on mats on every single night. It's unacceptable. We can do so much better than this. And to think that, I mean, I think of my own childhood. We were very poor growing up. And um, I, if it wasn't for the most incredible mother that I could have ever imagined, I easily could have ended up in a shelter. And if I would have ended up in a shelter sleeping on a mat nine inches away from another person, the trauma of experiencing that would have been with me for my entire life. So I think about that on a daily basis, and that's why we so desperately need to get to a different shelter location and model so we can truly, truly make the difference in which we all in municipal government care about. Good morning. Um, thank you so much, and I want to thank the Chamber um, also for highlighting Portland Recovery Community Center this morning. Um, I'm Leslie Clark, and I have a question about, um, about housing. So. Um, as you probably know, Portland um, has become known nationally as a real um, recovery town, a good place to come and find recovery. And we know um, on the 
hope and positive, the other side of the opioid epidemic is how many people are recovering and how that's possible and what great workers, productive, responsible workers, good neighbors, people in recovery make. And to have all these young people here, um, there's more than um, a few romances that blossom in recovery and people who want to start families and live and work in Portland and um, a lot of employers who are appreciating what great workers, um, people in recovery make, but housing becomes such a big issue, affordable housing, and then people who have, in particular, a uh, criminal history related to um, drug use um, and um, earlier days, and then that stands in the way of being able to find safe, affordable housing for themselves and their um, young families. Could you talk a little bit more about housing and affordable housing and how we might approach this to be able to keep people here in our community. Leslie, thank you for that question. I will say that we are truly blessed in this community to have a single individual, Councillor Jill Dusan, who has spent her career uh, with the city uh, on housing issues. She leads our housing committee uh, she has approached um, this committee in a very collaborative fashion, uh, unfortunately under trying circumstances at times where you know, certain groups want us to do this, other groups want us to do that, and that's the balance that I think she's effectively struck as, a, um, as the leader of, 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 of the housing committee. This is not a Portland issue exclusively. Uh, housing issues are every city in the country uh, are, are challenged with the affordability of housing. And it really goes back to the Great Recession when the home builders and others, when, when they stop building, you know, and, and, and the capacity shrinks. It's, uh, ironically, I said this at the last time I was here, you know, there's a supply and demand issue that's going, it's a market effect. And so what's happening is, is that um, we are, as we've come out of the Great Recession, and unfortunately some of the, the data that we're looking at internally indicates that we may be entering in a slowing down period, um, which is going to also be challenging for the city, but also could potentially be a, a better place uh, for rents, housing prices, we're seeing a decline in that. Specifically though, on the city side, we are very focused on, um, and this is where Councillor Dusan again has demonstrated great leadership on what we call the housing trust. And so the, we use, there's this pot of money that, that we use through housing. Uh, whenever a developer takes down a building and there's units that have been displaced, they have to pay a fee to the city. Uh, that money goes into the housing trust. There are other sources of revenue that goes into the housing trust. And we're able to use that money to leverage development private sector development for housing, uh, which has been critically important, I think, for the city. We're not anywhere near where Councilor Dusan and the rest of the council would love to be in terms of the affordability um, of the city and also new development, but uh, we are making a lot of strides. We're also looking at parcels the city owns that we don't necessarily need um, and that we could use to incentivize private developers to build affordable housing that will benefit the, the city overall. So for instance, where the former West School used to be, uh, the housing committee has recently uh, decided that we wanna be able to sell that West School site in order to create uh, housing there, uh, or affordable housing. Um, and so when you, when the city puts the land in into a deal, you think about the numbers, those of us who've been de who de developed in the past, you, you know that the land acquisition costs are one of the most significant uh, challenges that you have uh, when you're developing. And so uh, if the city can play that kind of role in, in um, either ground leases or the, the, the complete distribution of certain land, parcels to incentivize future housing, I think that's a critical part of what we're doing. We are we time. out of time for questions, I apologize. Out of, can you, can you be quick? Let's do it, I'm override. Kathy, I'm Kathy Elkins, I'm a volunteer for Preble Street, 
And I wonder, could you expand on your collaboration with Preble Street and the use of the Resource Center? Yeah, thank you for that question because there's been a, a lot of things said in the, in the newspaper and everything that doesn't really capture the true spirit of the collaboration that we've been trying to have with Preble Street. And also with, uh, with their, um, there's a group called Homeless Voices for Justice. It's an advocacy group that's um, really focused on um, issues relating to the homeless population. I have a terrific working relationship with H HVJ, Homeless Voices for Justice. Um, Dylan Monahan, who is the, um, the executive director of that, we've met on any number of occasions in order to um, be able to have productive conversations. Recently, uh, Councilor Dusan, the mayor and I went, um, and other city staff went to Pre the Preble Street, Preble Street Resource Center to have a, a community forum with, um, with uh, folks who are at the Resource Center. And, uh, and I thought we had a very direct, honest conversation about uh, the challenges that certainly I see in the city. Um, in terms of the Resource Center, the, um, the homeless, or the, I'm sorry, the Oxford Street Shelter and the Resource Center, uh, frankly, have created a lot of challenges in those neighborhoods. Um, and we're responsible, the city is responsible for, for many of the things that have happened in those neighborhoods, but so is, so is the Resource Center as well. So what we've been doing is we've been working, uh, working together to try to resolve uh, a lot of those issues. I venture to say that no one in this room would put up with, for five minutes, some of the things that those neighbors, those property owners in the Bayside area have to deal with. I know I wouldn't be, I'd be marching on City Hall. And so that is really, really important to have that kind of dialogue and discussion with uh, Mark Swan and, and others um, in, uh, at Preble Street to be able to figure a way out, to, figuring a way to work together so that they can continue to achieve the mission that they originally set out to do, but also recognize the city has a responsibility to do a much better job than we have been doing, so. I wanna thank uh, John, you for being here today. Oh. It's been very informative. We, as is our custom, will make a uh, donation to the P Portland Recovery Community Center in your name. Thank you for that. And um, if we could all uh, please uh, thank John for his time here today.